All right, how's everybody doing today, huh? You guys doing good? Wonderful, wonderful. How's everybody doing on their fast, huh? Can you believe it? Just one more week to go. Yes, yes. Hey, before we continue in today's uh, service, just a a quick reminder, we're we're changing up our service flow just a little bit to give you a little bit more time to uh, worship and perhaps uh, pray at the end of the service. And so I just want to remind you, as the video said, that on the seats in front of you, our connection card. If there's anything that we can pray for you about, if it's your first time at Celebration or you're new, please fill this out, let us know about that. We would love to pray for you. And then also, of course, your tithe and offering uh, envelope. If you are giving today and putting God first in your finances, I would go ahead and fill that out now as we're kind of talking about a few things before we get into uh, the message today because at the end of the service, we're gonna kind of flow into some worship and uh, just a reminder that uh, you can give the connection or turn in your connection cards and give of your tithes and offerings at all of the exits. Um, there's a box there on a table as you leave. Awesome. Church, would you please help me welcome all of our locations and campuses and everybody watching online today? All right. Man, we want to welcome you into the service today. Of course, we have one week to go. In our 21 days of prayer and fasting, and this is the big week. week. Everybody say big week. So this week we are having our annual three-day God First Awakening Revival. Um, It's going to be Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. And I'm just telling you, you want to finish the fast strong. Maybe you've been fasting a couple of days a week, or you know, um, maybe you're new and you haven't fasted at all. Uh, Look, fast. These three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we see so many miracles, so many breakthroughs. It kind of all just comes together during these three nights of revival. You want to bring your friends, family members. It's going to be a lot of fun. I promise you we will not go too late. I know kids have school the next morning. I have kids uh, too. So how many of you know we stay on time when your wife wants you to stay on time, okay? And so they'll be from about 7 to 8.30. They're going to be powerful. We'll have the Hillsong London team here. We'll have uh, uh, Pastor uh, Chris Hodges and Church of the Highlands and his team here. It's going to be a fantastic, fantastic three days. And then we end the fast this Sunday. We'll kind of break it. We'll take communion uh, together, and uh, that'll be a real powerful experience. So Wonderful. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be awesome. Okay, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to go to Acts chapter 15 or, you know, with your iPhones, you can pull up your Bible app and uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 13. I'll get there in just a second, but I want to read you just a couple of scriptures before I read that one. And the first one is found in 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 15. It says, Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. That's a priestly garment. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord. Look how they brought up the ark of the Lord that contained the presence of God with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Acts 13, 22. Speaking of this same King David, they said, And when... He had removed him, speaking of the previous king Saul. He raised up for them David as a king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And of course, David is commonly known as the man who was after God's own heart. He was known as the worshiping king and the king that was truly after God's own heart. And then Acts 15, 13 through 17 Now, let me tell you what's going on here. This is the council in Jerusalem, and this is kind of a big powwow with the apostles and chief elders. And what they're talking about here is what should should the Gentiles uh, obey any part of the law of Moses? There were some Jewish followers of Christ who believed that they should. And so there was this kind of debate as to what was going on and how worship could look and all these kind of things. And And in verse 13, it says, And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take them out, or to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. So now he's going to quote a prophecy here. The words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David 
which has fallen down, I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all of these things. I want to talk to you about the power and purpose of praise and worship, and I've entitled this message, Freedom Through Praise and Worship. Freedom through praise and worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and just thank you so much for the privilege of your presence, God, and how it's so easily acceptable to all of us, God, so easily accessible to all of us. And we just give you the thanks in what you're going to do today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. And amen. You know, there has been a lot of discussion and even arguments about praise and worship in the body of Christ, really ever since the church began over 2,000 years ago. And perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps What we see here in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 is that perhaps this was the first major discussion about praise and worship and how things were going to look for not only the Jewish believers, but non-Jewish believers. And so praise and worship has always kind of been at the forefront of, of Christian practice. And I would say this, I would say, especially over the last 30 to 40 years, there's really been a lot of discussion about praise and worship. And you can go to churches and you can find, you know, praise and worship with every different style, with every different structure. You know, I mean, some like it silent, some like it loud. Some like big words on the screen, some like hymnals. Some like a lot of instruments, some like no instruments. I mean, you can just find such a wide range of praise and worship. But here's what I want us to look at this morning. What does the Bible say about praise and worship? And and in the Bible, is there more of a prescribed style or a prescribed manner of praise and worship? Because here in Acts chapter 15, the apostles are actually start to discuss this in the context of how Gentile believers, that's us, non-Jews, how Gentile believers should approach God. And it's very, very interesting what they say. They kind of come to this conclusion that, hey, look, man, we're not going to put any law on the Gentile believers. Let's remember what God said through the prophets, that in these last days, that he will restore the tabernacle of David. Now, when he quoted this prophecy, this was huge for the apostles and people in that room. I mean, that was a loaded prophecy, which is why when James said it, It was like the lights turned on and everybody said, all right, we can do this. Because if you understand the Old Testament in Jewish culture, when he said God's going to restore the tabernacle of David, man, the lights turned on. Because see, in the Old Testament and in the Old Covenant, there were actually three tabernacles, or you could say three temples. There was the tabernacle of Moses, there was the tabernacle of David, and there was the tabernacle or the temple of Solomon, David's son. And it's real interesting. God says, in the last days, I'm not going to restore the tabernacle of Moses, and I'm not going to restore the tabernacle or the temple of Solomon yet. Now, the temple of Solomon we, we will be rebuilt in the millennium or right before. That will be in Jerusalem. But this is talking about New Testament, New Covenant worship for Gentiles. That's why they're having this discussion. How should they engage God and what part of the law and all that? And James says, James reminds them, look, God's not rebuilding the tabernacle of Moses, and he's not going to rebuild the tabernacle of Solomon now in this dispensation of grace. He's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Now, this is really, really interesting because if you understand the three tabernacles, this spoke volumes to these apostles about, okay, what, what God really wanted from our lives and from our worship. And now, as we talk about praise and worship, uh, yes, I want to remind everyone, you're Your life is an act of worship, okay? There's a lifestyle of worship, right? Romans, we present ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. There's a lifestyle of worship as we serve Jesus. But specifically, yes, there's a lifestyle of worship. There's really three specific acts of worship or practices of worship for the New Testament believer. First of all, is praise and worship. We're talking about that today. Secondly, there's communion when we partake of the uh, the, the, the bread and the juice that represents the body and blood of Jesus. We'll be doing that next Sunday all together. It's going to be a powerful, powerful service as we break the fast and celebrate Christ. 
And then also in our giving, in our tithes, of all, in our tithes and offerings. The Bible specifically says that is an act of worship, that your tithe, your offering, it's holy to the Lord. That means it's consecrated to him for worship. That's why it's celebration on the, your, your kind of your last thing to do. It's like you're worshiping God with that final act of worship as you give of your tithes and offerings as you leave, as you lead. But in the practice of praise and worship, it's real interesting that God specifically says, I'm going to restore it in the New Testament church. It's going to be like it was in the tabernacle of David. So here's what that means. We can look at the life of David and the tabernacle of David, and we can see what God wants worship to be like for the New Testament church. So it's real interesting. Three tabernacles in the Old Testament, okay? First of all, there's a tabernacle of Moses, okay? In the tabernacle of Moses, and really for all three tabernacles, the central thing is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, it was just a con container. I mean, it was a nice, very decorative piece of furniture, but it was a container, and it not only represented, but it actually held, so to speak, the presence of God. Not all of God's presence, but that's where his presence dwelt. It was tangible. And you've, you know, in the uh, ark, it was covered by, you know, the mercy seat and the cherubim. And of course, in there was the broken tablets, the showbread, uh, Aaron's, not the showbread, the um, a, a pot of manna, of manna from the wilderness and uh, Aaron's uh, rod that had budded. And so you would go in the Holy of Holies, the high priest would go in once a year. And that's where he would pour the blood of a lamb over the mercy seat, over the presence of of God for the covering, watch, not cleansing, but the covering of all the sins of Israel for one year. Not cleansing, but covering. Aren't you glad we have a sacrifice from the ultimate Lamb of God, Jesus Christ? It doesn't just cover temporarily, but it cleanses us personally. Let me tell you about the tabernacle of Moses, man. Okay, so if you live back in the days of Moses, the tabernacle of Moses, you never saw the ark. You couldn't get anywhere near the ark. There was an outer court, there was an inner court, and then there was a holy of holies. So if you were just a regular person, I mean, you could never even get in the outer court. The outer court is where all the priests were sacrificing the animals. So you could just walk by the outer court and you know, you'd, all you, you couldn't see in it, but you'd just hear, you'd hear all of the you know, animals being slaughtered and all that stuff. And you know, they're cooking them all and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure it would have been torturous on a fast to walk by. The tabernacle of Moses, man, smell some burgers up in there. They got some lamb going on, got some ribs happening. You just kind of want to stay away from that if you fasted back then. So then the priest could be in there, but then there was the inner court where there was the, the showbread and the candlestick and the incense. And then some of the priests could go in the inner court, but then there was even another level. And that was the Holy of Holies that contained the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. And only one person could go in there, and that was the high priest, and he could only go in one time a year. And he had to do all this cleansing and rituals and all this kind of stuff, and they even would tie a rope around him in case he didn't clean himself upright. When he went into the Holy of Holies, if like he dropped dead, you know, they could kind of feel, you know, uh, you know man, there ain't no movement on this rope. Let's pull Pop out of there. God done killed him. But the tabernacle of Moses, it, it represented, it was it, religion, everything about the outward, everything that's insignificant, everything that's not, uh, uh, not insignificant, but not complete. That our